It's a case of, if you have that preference in terms of the food, please let us know um, and we we'll cater for you accordingly. There will be envelopes out shortly for the harvest um, altar service and our worship that weekend, half past ten, is led by Majors Andrew and Alison Gordian. Very much looking forward to that. Our worship next Sunday, led by Majors Mike and Sheila. Um, Majors Catherine Graham will be in worship at Portsmouth City. The funeral of Pat Jones will take place on Monday the 27th of September with a service at 3.15 at Wessex Vale Crematorium. At 7 o'clock here on the Monday there will be a service of thanksgiving um, in this hall. We continue to remember Brian, um, Stephen Green, Mike and Thomas as well um, at this time. So that, that information is in the newsletter as well. So our young people are out and about, universities are starting, um, Stephen Green are taking Mark today, Thomas didn't feel the need to go with them, so he's here. Um, so Mark is off to Chichester this morning, Michelle is off to Southampton University, she moves into her halls of residence on the 24th of September, the Friday, and her classes, if you believe that, her classes start on the Monday the 27th. I think it's freshers week and there may not be a lot of classes. But that's where she's going. Um, and Joy and others will be returning to university. So we continue um, to pray for them. There's information at the back as well about the Going Deeper group. If you want to take one of those leaflets, that would be really good. Let's look forward to being educated as we worship today. Thank you. Good morning. Good to see you all here today. Kathy's not well, so... Uh... Please remember her in prayer, won't you? 
and some material that we're looking at so on, she has prepared. So it doesn't sound like it's my words, that is the reason, okay? So let's commence worship by turn to scripture, and here is Psalm 119. It's not the whole psalm actually, because that's very long. It's Psalm 119 and verses 33 to 40. Right, it says this. Teach me, O Lord, to follow your decrees. Then I will keep them to the end. Give me an understanding, and I will keep your law. And I will obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the paths of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart towards your statutes, and not towards selfish gain. <coughs> Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant, so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. How I long for your precepts, preserve <coughs> my life in your righteousness. Amen. Well, as you've already heard, today has been announced by uh, churches together in England as Education Sunday. Um, I know you've all had an ed education. Uh, of some form or other, some of you can go way back, some of you have got brilliant memories. You can remember your first day at school. Anybody like that? Yeah, some of you have lost the list of time for me. Um, but there we are, we've got some memories of being at school, and uh, we thank God for the fact that uh, we're all literate, I think, here. And we can, we can read the screen up here, <coughs> we, we can write and so many things. Uh, so many blessings that have come through being educated. Um, we're meeting uh, today, we think about teachers. We've got a few in our congregation actually, if you, if you look around. Uh, we're thinking about children who've already returned to school. And of course, we're all in the business of lifelong learning. Uh, when I left school, day after school, my head teacher, I don't know why, because we always go and say cheerio to the head teacher. That still happened. I don't know. We got a handshake. And she said, Grandpa, you'll never stop learning as long as you live. And how true that is, I'm sure. Every day is something new for us to learn. Well, here's a song that some of you may have sung in your school assembly if you have them in those days, and it's Immortal, Invisible, God, Holy God. Would you like to stand if you're able, and let's sing together.
um, you remember who taught it to you. Um, perhaps it was a parent, grandparent, a relative, a friend. Maybe it's here, a sorrow for money. Um, one that I can remember, and I know Kat as well, uh, was a little song called, well, we're not going to sing this, by the way. A little star peeps o'er the hill. The woods are quiet, the birds are still. The children clasp their hands in prayer, and the love of God is everywhere. A lovely little song, a prayer song. Uh, another one that we're going to sing now, actually, I was talking to Sunday school. It's an anonymous song. Nobody knows who actually wrote the words, but we've sung it so often, and we're going to sing it again this morning. Teach me how to love. Teach me how to pray. Teach me how to serve thee better every day. It's a prayer for every day, isn't it? Not just when we worship together. A continual prayer. The Lord might continue his working in our hearts and our lives. Let's listen to the melody. The melody's going to, um, melody's going to play it through for us before we sing. For those of us that are gathered here today, 
We ask that as we worship, we might feel the presence of your Holy Spirit with us, blessing us. But we ask it in the name of Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, of heaven and earth. Amen. Now, most of us know that uh, Julie. Wolston Infant School. And uh, so on the education side, we thought, well, wow, what a great idea. We can invite Judy to come and share something or, uh, about, about her, her life. Well, not her whole life, but certainly about um, her life of education. We have got to I was thinking about when you said about first day at school, because I went to St. Monica's down the road, and uh, I can remember, and I, I, we were talking about it this week, and I can remember um, being brought a satchel. <laughs> and I had a satchel, and my dad took a photograph of me, stood outside of my Wendy house, all Bridgie Bill, and he took a photograph of me on my first day. I heard the bell, and I ran across the road, and that was it. Um, no, nobody took me in, I just ran across the road from my house where I lived and I could go into school. Um, yeah, I thought I was thinking this week. This is my 38th year working in schools. 38 years. The last 18 um, as a head teacher. Um, we've got a, 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 what is now classed as a small school, and we only have 180. Um, and that is classed as a small school. Six, form, um, six classes of 30 children um, and down in Wolston. We're mixed, we're very mixed. About a quarter of the children that attend my school live in the lowest 20%, uh, most 20% deprived area in, in the UK. A quarter of the children who attend our school live in what we would class as the 20% most deprived areas of the UK. Um, a third of them are, also, are on type to free school meals, which means money is an issue. And this is a growing group, and 20% of them do not speak English as their first language at home. So it's a diverse area, um, but I, I quite like that. The first children arrive at eight o'clock. They're the ones a bit like my child who have breakfast in the back of the car. Um, James didn't know you had milk with cereal until he was about 12, um, because you can't have that in the back of the car. Um, so they arrive about eight o'clock and they go into breakfast club and mum and dad go to work. And then half past eight, the gates open for everybody else. So my teachers have been early. If you park up at half seven in my car park, You've got to get space. They're in early. They're keen. And then our last children, again, those whose parents are working, leave us a quarter to six. So it's a long day for some of those young people. <coughs> One of the things that I always try and keep in my mind when I'm trying to do my job is I am a head teacher, but I'm a person first. I'm a person first. And I've got to keep that. Um, in mind when I'm trying to lead the school. My job is to lead. Sometimes that's hard um, when you have to say challenging things because it's got to be good enough for those children, it has to be good enough. Um, and sometimes you have to say really challenging things to really nice people who are doing the best they can. I often say to myself, no one gets up in the morning and thinks let's go to school today and do a really rubbish job. No one does that. I say that to parents. Nobody came in today to upset your child. Nobody came in today to not do their best. 
Um, my job is to set the example. My job is to motivate everyone. Sometimes that's really hard. To motivate everyone. To get everybody on board. To get everybody working together. To get everybody on the vision. I like things to run smoothly. I do not like disharmony in all aspects of my life. I do. I like peace and tranquility and everybody just doing their part. Um, and sometimes there are challenging conversations. I'm responsible for standards. We do want children to come to school and to learn and be happy and have a nice time and for it to be fun and creative and motivating. But I also won't apologise for the fact that we are there to teach children and children are there to learn. They have one chance and we can't let it slip. Every moment of every day, they have one chance and we're in. Um, I'm also responsible for safeguarding in the school and I think over the last 10 years, that's an area that has grown. That those children are safe. And I don't just mean physically, I mean emotionally. Um, that they are safe. And that, that's a growing area of my work. And sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that's really hard. Um, when I was thinking about this today, I was thinking there's so much I can tell you that I can't. There's so much I can tell you that would make you laugh but I can't. There's so much I could tell you that would make you cry, but I can't. And that's, that's what we face day to day. I've knocked on doors where children haven't got any food in the house. And we just listened to those parents. My last thing before I left quarter to six on Friday was the parent who phoned me and said, Mrs. Swanson, I don't suppose you've got any food we could have for the weekend. Yeah, of course we can. I'll drop it down on my way home. It's, they're simple solutions, but you just have to listen and you have to care. I'm also really accountable. People think, oh, the head teacher, you know. <laughs> no, I'm really accountable um, to the council, to the academy trust, to my parents, to my children, to my staff, and to my governors, and to this thing called Ofsted. <laughs> I can't decide whether to do one more year at school or two more. I'm working, if I could do one more, I might miss them because I think they're going to come in 2023. It's quite tempting, it's quite tempting. You have to put people first, you have to take people with you because you can't do it all on your own. Again, you can't expect children to learn if they're hungry or dirty or don't have any school uniform on. When I was much younger, I used to get a bit indignant about this. I used to think, well, I've seen parents, they've got a really nice bone, um, mum's got really nice nails, um, lots of tattoos, and you know, things that cost money. And yet your child hasn't had breakfast, and it used to really annoy me. And I've had to do something about that. And my, my mantra now is, but the child didn't choose that. The child didn't choose that. And so we make sure those children have everything that they need. Because no one's going to learn when you've got an empty tummy. You can't concentrate if you're hungry or thirsty or you're a bit grubby. So I couldn't expect children to do that either. And so that's really important. One thing is for certain in schools, every day is different. There's never a, oh, let's have a normal day. It never happens. No two days are the same. But you have to give people time. I think that's, that's the thing I've learned most. You have to give people time. Um, it is all consuming. Um, I, I dread those texts about quarter to seven, or sometimes quarter to six in the morning, I'm not well today. Uh, because that means we need to find somebody to do that job. It's exhausting. <clears throat> and I love it. <laughs> and sometimes what would be popular is not always right. And those are hard things. I don't know what's going to happen. I've got a list of things I'm going to do tomorrow. I probably will get two of them done because other things will happen. I quite like that. If I knew what I was going to do every day, that probably wouldn't be so good. I don't know 
other school is near to where you live, you might live in the local area, you might be near Showling, you might be near Valentine, you might be near Thorn Hill, Springwell School on the corner. Oh, what an amazing place that is. Um, all our local schools, pray for the people that are in them, pray for the work they're doing. You might want to be a governor. Governors are amazing. They're the people that ask me the difficult questions and say, why are you doing it like that? You could be a governor in a school. There's a place for everybody. We have five key values in my school and one really simple strap line, and I'll leave you with them. They are kindness, perseverance. <coughs> Our children find it really hard to be resilient and carry on when it goes wrong. Really hard. Um, life for the children, and I think this is the biggest thing, I haven't even touched on lockdown, oh my word, um, is that everything now is instant. It sings, it dances, it moves, it's all on the screen. And when you're working with the screen, you are totally in control. You manage what happens on that screen, and when you press a button, it does it. And life's not like that. Life's about kindness, perseverance, tolerance, cooperation. And we have to work really, really hard with our young people to instill those values. And the final one is achievement, because that is what you go to school to do. You go to school to learn, and if, you, if you're successful and you learn, your life chances are improved by that. Because then you can get a job, and I tell my five-year-olds this, because then you can get a job. Some of my children don't know what going to work is. You can get a job and it improves what you can then, you can then choose what you do with your life. And our final little strap line, and I'll leave you with it, is also in the school where everyone matters. Thanks, Julie, for sharing with us this morning and giving us wonderful insights. And uh, that will help us to pray for you uh, in your school. Let's now turn the back and uh, we're going to be there in the scriptures now before we share the scripture. Now.
But for now, we're going to have another person involved in education. Uh, Stephen is going to come and he's going to tell us some of the creative ways that he's trying to uh, teach young people. Thank you. We thought they were in the meeting. <laughs> now, I think I should just put a word of warning in to make sure Glenda and Daisy are listening. I'm saying no more at this point, but I might get to it a bit later on. So, a bit like Judy, 40 years next state when I've been teaching. Too long. Now, now okay, wait for this, I want you to write this down. I am now a Lego Education Academy accredited trainer. <laughs> Do you know the scripture tells us we are fearfully and wonderfully made? Well, so is Lego, but actually, so are our children, our young people. But they don't always recognise that. They don't recognise how fearfully and wonderfully they are made. So, Lego Education has a, a separate brand of Lego was founded in 1980, a distinct brand um, of Lego, targeted at schools and colleges, um, particular emphasis on STEAM engagement, science, technology, engineering, the arts, and maths. That's its kind of focus, when it's panicking, she's heard the maths. Um, going back to Lego Foundation, which is a charitable group of Lego, has given billions of dollars over the years um, to reach out to children around the world, most recently in Afghanistan, where those children have suffered so much, um, where just resources beyond resources, time, money, um, and lots of Lego um, has gone out to places like that. But as a business, it's been founded on Christian principles. Christian family, um, Ollie Kirk Christiansen, um, speak to Lisa about Billund in Denmark. In Danish, Lego is derived from two words, legot, um, which means play well. And in Latin, Lego means I put together. Playful learning is allowed. Playful learning is allowed. But a bit like Judy was saying about how important it is for our children, Lego's mantra is only our best is good enough. We owe that to the children and the families that, that we work with. Only our best is good enough. So I sometimes use the bricks um, and ask people to build something that tells me something about them that I or people they're working with or their teachers or wherever the situation is didn't know about them. Now this really helps with their communication. It means they can verbalise on what they've built. They can create stories and tell stories that they can't always do for themselves. But suddenly when they build something that represents what they're thinking, they're able to say, well, what I was thinking was, look, this is my dad, this is my allotment, this is, and so on. The stories that they can create really help to build their confidence and can tell you things that are really nice to know. Can tell you things too that you think, I need to listen to that and I need to respond and react and support this child with that. So the whole non-threatening, fun way of learning, quite permissible, um, is where a lot of what I'm doing right now is at. So in true Lego style, which is hands-on, minds-on, so you physically need to do something. You can't talk about Lego, you have to do Lego. So I'm going to invite, let me come up, but Faye, sorry, Daisy and Glenda, I'm going to give them a bag of Lego each with exactly the same pieces in it and ask them after the meeting, five minutes, during if you want to, five minutes build time to build something that tells us something about you that we don't know. Because you're both very new to us. So it would be good to see that. Then you get to argue over who wants the motorbike. Because it may be part of your story, I don't know. So there's one motorbike. Everything else is exactly the same. During coffee and cookies, um, all of us can ask them what they've built and find out something about Glenda and Daisy that we didn't know. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. That's something to look forward to. <laughs> we'll take a picture of it. 
<laughs> oh, and I uh, think you said earlier on, we've got the gazebo out there as well, which we're going to dedicate. So we want everybody to come out there and, and uh, be part of that special event after the meeting. Um, it's really good to be in here on Thursday of this week, that's quite a special day. And to have uh, so many cameo members returning, it was so well organised, uh, very, very COVID safe, registration in the foyer, um, drinks out there in the community hall and the meeting in here. Great to see so many people return. And then the ladies fellowship in the evening as well. And there's a real buzz around this place on Thursday. Um, Sheila is taking some of our young people out just now uh, as we resume some kind of teaching program. We're actually hopefully building that. Think about young people. Uh, think of those who are not here. Pray for them, won't you? It's so important. Well, we haven't done for quite a long time, have we? So, and it's time to stand if you'd like to. <coughs> Teach me to dance. What else could I choose? Teach me to dance. To the beat of your heart. Please stand and sing together. It goes pretty quickly, so try and keep up. Troop in there, 
and uh, have our music lesson. Um, now, one distinctive afternoon I do recall, the teacher got out and I think called LP, <laughs> asked me afterwards if you've got young people, and LP got out the sleeve and put it on the turntable. And music entered the classroom, and 30 of us there, and 9 10 year olds, I guess, were sitting listening to this wonderful music. And I'd never heard this particular music before. Now, at home, my mum was a big fan of Pat Booth. <laughs> you know, Pat Booth. But my dad was a real, what they call, as they say, band all these days. And he had all this real to real tape recorders full of band marchers. I was brought up on band marchers, basically. <laughs> uh, but he was something completely different. And uh, as the music came out, it was traumatic and menacing. Uh, and uh, a new world was suddenly created in that classroom. For those of you who may know the music, it was Gustav Holtz, Mars the Bringer of War. If you've never listened to it, try and listen to it, then you get back home. And a relentless pounding beat. The musicians, it's in five, four time. Uh, and uh, relentlessly going on, building and snarling of the trombones and uh, and at the night of seven people on timpanis, there's eight French horn players. That's a lot, isn't there? Yeah, I think so, anyway. Full symphony orchestra going. I could go on right this for ages, friends. I tell you, but I won't bore you too much. But anyway, for me, this was absolutely a new world of music that I've never really heard before. Seven minutes, but wow, by the end of it, I was hooked on that particular piece of music. And the thing that I went out, I guess with mum, on Saturday was to go and buy this LP, this LP, the full suite, well, some of a bit inaccessible, but um, the full suite of music. I think I remember telling the teacher that I, I bought that particular LP, so hopefully she thought, oh, well, some of this was thinking and food's to buy it at least. But yeah, it's still exciting to listen to Gustav Hart. I was hooked, it still remains one of my favourite pieces. Little did that teacher know that by inspiring me with that piece of music, that eventually I would learn to play trombone. And would play in some orchestras. And that 12 years later, I would be standing in front of a classroom of teenagers as a secondary school class music teacher, teaching music. Well, I wish I could tell that story to that person who put on that LP in a porter cabin in Christchurch. There we are. You can never tell. Um, I don't know what teachers would say about their, their purpose, but surely opening up worlds of understanding and experience is a chance that they certainly are embracing. Jesus was known by many in his day as Rabbi. They addressed him as Rabbi, or, you know, a Jewish teacher. Some people say teacher. And as he spoke to people, he very often opened up these new worlds, he talked about the new kingdom of God. People experienced new things, they saw life in a different way, experienced inward change. We know some of the, the parables, don't we? They were excellent teaching tools that we remember even to this day so easily. Not only the synagogues teaching, but out there on the hillsides, in the streets, wherever he was. And he had this knack of always teaching. 
no matter what the situation came up, he taught through what happened. And here he is on this occasion here, and he's been invited to dinner. Well, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Uh, we all like being invited out to dinner. Uh, and it's a bit more complicated these days, as Stephen was saying about, oh yeah, we've got so many things to avoid, haven't we? But it did used to be a bit simpler, I, I think. And here he was, the home of Simon the Pharisee, a well-known person in that community. A uh, Pharisee, a, a, a Jewish leader. He spoke, he preached in the synagogues. But he also had a nice house. And typically we're told that he had a courtyard and there would be a fountain there in the courtyard. It's quite a nice, cool place to meet uh, after the heat of the day was over. And Simon invited some of his friends there. It all seems rather pleasant, doesn't it? But some religious people, like Simon, were doing some deep thinking about Jesus and his teaching. And the world that he was describing, they, they knew that it impacted upon their world. And it was a threat to their world. And they were always looking out for things that weren't quite right. Reasons to kind of undermine him or to blacken his reputation in, in some way with people. So it wasn't such a, a friendly invitation, I don't think. And so into this courtyard, this open courtyard of the house, comes this notoriously sinful woman, a prostitute. She's been caught up in that industry that has robbed her of so much. But the Holy Spirit, you see, um, it, does, it does work in anyone's life, doesn't it? He doesn't say that person beyond redemption or whatever. He's doing a work of grace in her life and changing her world. And she comes, I guess she's already heard about Jesus, perhaps she's heard his teaching out there in the streets. And she comes because she hears that he's at Simon's home. She wants to experience this new world, this new life that he's speaking about. Now she would not have been welcomed to go to the synagogue because of her reputation and her, her lifestyle, you see. But she can approach Jesus. She knows instinctively that there will be a welcome at the feet of Jesus. And this was to be for her a life-changing encounter. Now there were no tables and chairs in those days. I think I would have found that quite difficult, quite honestly. You know, people just lounged around on the floor, you know, in Eastern relaxed style. They leaned on one arm and, and um, their legs behind them and they use the other hand and arm for eating. That was their, their way of doing it. And so she enters that courtyard there. And she comes into the presence of Jesus and she's moved to tears of repentance and gratitude in her heart, and tears flow from her eyes upon the dusty feet of Jesus. Out of love and, ex and forgiveness, given that she believes she's received, she opens this little jar, we could say, a phial of, of perfume that she wears around her neck, very costly, and she breaks the neck of the jar. One you, it's only used once. She breaks the neck and pours this on the feet of Jesus. And then she begins to wipe his feet with her hair. She breaks a massive taboo by even doing that by loosening his long hair. And people are offended by all that's going on. Actually, something wonderful is taking place in her heart and her life. 
and that is difficult for us to really get a grip on all of that. Something beautiful was happening, but other around the table, like Sam, were offended. And they said to themselves, well, Jesus surely knows this woman is a, a sinful woman. Uh, he's a prophet as well. And what's he doing? Even allowing her to touch him. And they sought to undermine who Jesus was. She knew that she had been forgiven much. And she's beginning her life as a new child of God. Some the Pharisee was known as a separated one. They all were. They were the religious elite. They kept away from sinners just in case they got contaminated. There was a coldness about this man. Now, normally when people came to be a guest in your home, there would be common courtesies. We have our common courtesies, don't we? That we offer to people. Um, when they come into our homes. Uh, but he'd not given any of those. There was no water to wash the dusty feet of Jesus. That had not been offered. There was normally the Eastern tradition of a kiss, of welcome. There was normally some ointment that was applied to your head, even. That was all the norm. That was all the welcoming stuff that would have gone on. But he didn't even offer any of that. In the presence of Jesus, you see, he was just indifferent. And so Jesus tells him a story, a teaching tool. He tells a story about two debtors, one who owned a vast amount of money and one a small man. Okay, Simon, who would love him the most? And Jesus doesn't tell him the answer. He gets him to answer the question. Well, he says, I guess the one who owes the most would love the most. And Jesus said, yes, you've got it. This woman loves greatly because she realises the depth of her sin and therefore she loves. The son, you see, he was a religious teacher, he knew his scripture, he knew the greatest commandment. Thou must love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind and body. But in his heart, it was coldness. There was no love. There was no love there. He had not realized, you see, that he himself was a sinner. Far away from God, doing things that outwardly were right, you might say, but in his heart there was no love for God. But in the heart of this woman there was love for God. There was gratitude. And she had entered into a new world of living. And Jesus had tried to show Simon that he could enter too into this new world of living. But he was indifferent to it all. It's sad. In front of the guests, Jesus announces to the woman, Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. She stepped into a new world, a new person. And how we are praying as a company of God's people for others to come into that experience. Young people, teenagers, older people, well, to come and to step into the new world of God's kingdom, to know his life, to know his love, to know his forgiveness. Jesus didn't just talk and teach. He demonstrated I and mean, ultimately that forgiveness was achieved for that woman and for us through the cross of Calvary. As one songwriter considered the cross 
And consider the love of Jesus, he wrote the words. Here is love, vast as an ocean, loving kindness as the flood. You know, when Mary Magdalene went to the tomb on Resurrection Day, she met Jesus there. She thought she was talking to the gardener. But when he called her name, she realised who he was. Now she didn't say, Lord, Jesus, Saviour. What she said was, Rabboni, which means literally, my teacher. Those are the words that came spontaneously to her lips. My teacher. Well, he's our teacher too, isn't he? He's my teacher. He's your teacher. And day by day, he is teaching us through the circumstances, through the journey that we're all on. He is teaching us. May we be people who are ready to learn and to grow and live in the world of his kingdom that he calls us to follow. We're going to sing that lovely song now before we pray together. The words that come out of the, the Welsh Revival which we've seen that many, many years ago. May God deepen our love for him. He is our teacher. He is with us today. Let's sing together.
how to live, how to behave. It tells us your wonderful story. Lord, we conclude with that prayer. Teach me how to love you. Teach me how to pray. Teach me how to serve you better day by day. Lord, we ask it in your name. Amen. <laughs>
The words of the Apostle Paul are found in Romans chapter 12. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing and perfect love. Amen. God bless you.
Enjoy it. 